Topics may be a little bit heavy and be a little bit late, so I will fly. Right? We have about 60 slides, but I think we'll cover them all. Can you hear me? Yeah? Okay. So, <laughs> program synthesis, yeah. right? Program synthesis by LLMs, basically, uh, how to make a large language models to write code for you. And many of you probably already tried already, but I want to do some motivation, right? And I would like to go some brief history. And actually, you know, what can we do to do it better, right? And maybe we want to develop our own system. Okay, awesome. So intro and motivation is the real thing, or just, you know, it's a toy. It's a toy for academia. And I would argue that it is a real thing. It's currently being used in the industry. So here we go. There is a blog post by Google in 2022. They're talking about the eternal tool. This is the architecture of this tool. It's a hybrid system, 0 0.5 billion parameters. And uh, according to this blog post, about 3%, uh, almost 3% of code currently being pushed and, you know, good, uh, Google code space is actually ML generated. How about here? Better? Okay. Okay. Uh, yes. So ML generated code. ML generated code, there is a blog post by Google 2022. And this blog post describes uh, some architecture. They use a small transformer, hybrid system, 0 0.5 billion. And according to this blog post, you know, 2.6% uh, of code that being pushed by this group, 10,000 people, is ML generated code. So it is being used in industry and, you know, successfully. Okay, great. Uh, this is eternal tool. We don't have access to it. And I would like to see bigger statistics. Uh, there is some tools that are currently being uh, tested uh, via verified uh, partners. So one of them would be Doit AI for Workspace, and our one would be, you know, Cody by Colab. Some of you may be part of this problem. Uh, I'm sorry, program. And um, it's not fully announced yet. It was announced, some of it was announced on Google I.O. Uh, we expect big announcement at uh, Google Next, right? It will happen at the end of the August. Okay, awesome. Um, tool that is actually available for general public, right? It's GitHub Copilot, and they did share some numbers. So they share some numbers that apparently in June 2020, uh, 2022, I'm sorry, there was a 20%, 27% of code that was generated, was generated with GitHub Copilot. Awesome. Uh, as you know, it's a plugin for VS Code, not everybody knows. And there is growth. There is obvious growth that in February 2023, already 46% of code being generated with, you know, uh, AI assistive tooling. Mm -hmm. And apparently for some reason, you know, 60% of Java mm -hmm. developers are using this copilot. I don't know why. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So question is why, right? Why would you use it? Uh, many of us already use it and you don't need explanation, but some of you maybe not. And uh, they did this uh, research and they published the results in 2022. So they took uh, 100 developers, 95 developers. They split in two groups. Uh, one of them did use Copilot, and another one did not use Copilot. First of all, success, and these were JavaScript developers, success rate uh, for people who did use Copilot was high. It was about 78%. But most importantly, the speed was so much faster, right? Uh, one hour versus two and a half hours. So there is obvious advantages to use this um, tool. Now, back in the days, 2022, last year, in the current days, um, people argued that, you know, yes, this is great, but it can write only easy code. It can write only easy code, or it only can do, you know, um, auto-completion tasks. It can write, you know, the you know, hard questions. It can do hard problems. And this is where DeepMind came in. Uh, brief history of English. DeepMind came in uh, with alpha code. Right, uh, DeepMind is known uh, to go into the some you know arenas where there would be only humans. Good examples would be you know uh, StarCraft, you know Go again, and then they would uh, come in, build the system, and you know completely take over. So this is what they tried to do here. Right, they took the platform, a popular platform, which is called Force. There's about six hundred thousand people involved. Uh, this platform is uh, competitive programmers who consider you know, coding as a sport, and they would compete versus uh, this group of people. So they build the system. They build the system. It's not just large language model. It's actually you know, bigger than that. And they called it um, alpha code. This is example 
of the task. So we'll be on the same page, right? So very probably most of you, most of developers know what uh, lead code is. This is similar to lead code. So you have task description. And important part that uh, actually the lead code, you don't get only task description. You also have some unit testing, right? You get example input output. This is important part of the system. So these tasks considered to be, you know, uh, medium level. And alpha code can solve it. This is a solution of, you know, provided by alpha code. For me, it's impressive. I wouldn't be able to solve it, you know, very fast. I would spend 45 minutes, one hour before I would come up with fence. Okay, great. So how does it work? It starts as, you know, traditional large language models. Uh, you know, they took the GitHub code base, they pre-trained the model, and then they fine-tuned the model. And there's uh, small tricks on both uh, sides of the system in pre-training and fine-tuning. By the way, for pre-training, apparently it's uh, beneficial to be uh, diverse, to uh, grab, you know, all languages, so most popular languages, not just Python, even if your answer is only in Python. And this is how the sizes of the models they produce, uh, anywhere from 300 million to 41 billion. Fun fact that uh, they didn't have enough um, budget for training to fully train 41 billion uh, model. They went slightly um, under time, but it still showed better results than others. Yeah, scaling low, so everybody knows that. Bigger the model, better results. Awesome. So what's so special about the system, alpha code? You see all this part right here. Can you see my mouse? Yeah, you can see my mouse. Um, so they take advantage that they put uh, compute budget, not just in training, they uh, put compute budget in sampling. Because, you know, if uh, probably when you're talking to ChatGPT or then you're uh, you know, making your own code, you would ask, you would have one, two, three different variations, right? With ChatGPT, I don't know, maybe you will ask system one, maybe two, maybe three times. But you can ask the system a million times. Nothing stops you, right? And you can actually do it in parallel. And this is what they did. The key of this system is large scale sampling. The only problem is, you know, if I have this 1 million solutions, uh, at the end, I can uh, submit only a few. In this case, they put limit of 10, 10 solutions. So how to choose out of this 1 million different solutions, only 10, 10 the best. And we'll go for it. Uh, again, taking advantage of beam search. If we don't know, some of us don't know, large language models, they don't produce whole text for you right away. And it's uh, cool how ChatGPT, I like it, how, you know, it uh, actually types things for you because it produces one token at a time. Uh, there is, uh, there is di uh, distribution. And as Eugene mentioned, there is a stochastic problem, right? So stochastic sampling, how you would choose. So you actually can, you know, explore fully the stream, not just choose one branch. Okay, so this diagram just shows um, it's log linear scale that uh, more you sample, higher chances that one of the solutions will be correct solution and uh, bigger models uh, have better probability of finding correct solution. Okay, this one is interesting. This one is interesting, it's ablation study. There is a uh, vanilla, uh, there is a filtering and there is clustering. So filtering is a simple one. Do you remember I mentioned at the beginning, uh, example input output, right? So apparently if you do this large sampling, uh, many of the solutions are wrong, like up to 99 solutions are wrong. So you can just remove them by random filtering. And that makes sense. But what's interesting here is sampling. I'm sorry, clustering. So clustering, what they did, they train separate model. They train separate model just on the inputs. You know, just on unit tests. So they have now a special model that produces unit tests for you. Not just, you know, one, two, three, many, like 10, 100. Now, if I will take my program and run all these uh, different unit tests, I don't have outputs. They did not rely on outputs because it was back in time, you know, they didn't believe that could provide good outputs, but at least they have inputs. So if two programs provide exactly the same inputs on multiple, um, same outputs on multiple inputs, probably they're semantically same. Right, we can assume that. So it's a, uh, just maybe different, you know, variable name. So now we can put them in the same cluster. So now I have, you know, these big clusters, and I don't need to take, you know, multiple solutions from this cluster. I can take one because I have, you know, certain assumption that it's exactly the same program. 
And this is what clustering about. And another cool thing that they found, the bigger the cluster, the higher chance that this actually correct solution. It's kind of like um, consensus, consensus of the group. Okay, uh, great. And with these two methods, they got much higher scores. And they won over 52%, I'm sorry, 54% of people. So they ran it against of, you know, 10 different competitions, 10 different challenges, you know, and it was uh, at that time groundbreaking result. So they showed that these systems can be as good as uh, a regular uh, human challenge. Awesome. So on the top of this paper, why do you like this paper, uh, previous paper, because there is uh, quite a few papers being built on top. So this one is code T. Code T, code T is built by Microsoft team um, soon after. Uh, they is similar to a certain extent. They took the idea of don't just ask to generate the code, ask to generate the unit tests, right? So now you're generating the code, you're generating the unit tests. And another interesting thing that they did not use, uh, you know, model from scratch, they didn't train model from scratch. They used GPT 3.5. And GPT 3.5 was already big enough and uh, smart enough that it could uh, produce not just inputs for output tests, but also uh, inputs for the unit tests, but also outputs with high chance of being correct. It's not 100%, but there is a high chance uh, that, you know, input and output both are correct. And now they used a uh, concept of cons uh, consensus uh, similar to Ransack algorithm. So we'll go really fast. There is two metrics that are actually being accounted here, how these different solutions, how these different clusters are being ranked. Uh, one, as we mentioned before, we just count uh, how many uh, solutions in one cluster, right? But another metric is how many uh, solutions, how many unit tests actually um, valid according to this fake unit tests. And they showed very good results. They showed very good results. Uh, they were able to uh, beat previous and they were able to beat just, you know, vanilla GPT 3.5 generation by using the system. They compared, they didn't have access to the alpha code, but they replicated and still it was better. Okay, awesome, great. So there was paper in uh, 2023 uh, by DeepMind again. And now they used uh, reinforcement learning uh, to optimize the sorting algorithm. To optimize the sorting algorithm, uh, paper was published in Nature. So they come up with this game and they call this game assembly game. Assembly game, uh, so each action of this game, what you could do, you could change the algorithm, you could add the command. It's all in assembly language, so your action space is small. Um, and they train the transformer. Uh, so it's actually reinforcement learning. You also have, you know, uh, agent plane, uh, collecting rewards, uh, so forth. But interesting part, uh, this is example of assembly. Interesting part that results were not just, you know, uh, interesting curious, but there was a certain breakthrough, right? Uh, results were real. The results were real uh, that they were able to actually uh, make improvements to leap C++ uh, patching, right? So it was, uh, first change to the subroutines in over decay. This is awesome. And this is uh, in particular one algorithm that they were able to optimize. This is great. Uh, this is awesome. And I also want to pay attention to the size of the model. Uh, this model was trained on TPUs under two days. So I assume it's under a few thousand dollars. It's a smaller model. It's, uh, you know, under one billion. So this is very specific, right? This is not uh, AJ. It's not, you know, a uh, general solution. It, this particular model solves this particular problem. And what interesting is, uh, there is emerging abilities, I will skip, that there was this, you know, Twitter post. Uh, guy, he is, you know, professor from university. He just asked exactly the same question, but he asked it from GPT-4. And GPT-4 was able to give him answer. And now he's wondering, you know, can he apply for nature too? So this is towards the emerging abilities of large language models. There was a paper by uh, Google and DeepMind 
they show that at certain stage, at certain size of language model, you have new abilities that you didn't train for. They just appear. Like nobody expect them, nobody, you know, uh, especially come up with fine tuning uh, some smart system. It's just there. Uh, cool example is emoji, emoji language, that at certain size, you know, your language model starts to understand emoji language. Uh, this is the question. What movie does this emoji describe? 2 million, uh, 16 million, 53 million, 1 billion, 4 billion, 8 billion, 47 billion. It's all garbage, right? But now all of a sudden, 128 billion, it knows that this movie is finding new. So we see the same you know, phenomenon here, right? Nobody trained in particular. Where is it? Yes. Nobody trained in particular GPT-4 to do optimization of assembly code for the search problem, but it just knows. And I think it's cool. Okay. Uh, if you're curious what prompt was used, this is the prompt. Uh, the following is compiled version of sorting algorithm assembly. I think it can be improved. If the following lines, the uh, asterisks can be indicate uh, which instruction could be removed to change. If not, do anything, take step by step, explain the reasoning, and go back to verify that is correct. So I know it maybe sounds like too simple, but maybe we do need to learn prompt engineering. Yep, and this is the result. It's much longer, but I, you know, grab the end. The goal is here. Then to summarize, we found that instruction move SP, as, um, SP can be removed. The rest of instructions are necessary for them to function correctly. And that exactly matches this part, this assembly part that people had to, you know, design very special algorithm, reinforcement learning algorithm. Okay, awesome. And this is, will be my pivot to the framework. To the framework, it's called Reflection. Uh, a few authors here from Princeton, MIT, uh, Northminster. So the cool thing about Reflection that we don't actually need to write special programs. I mean, we can and we should, but we can uh, even, you know, just go to the bar to go to GPT-4 and use this framework in order to get better results. Uh, these results uh, also use uh, unit testing, asking model to, clear, uh, to create the unit test, but there is also, you know, a reflection part, self-reflection part. So basically, do you see these uh, three boxes, uh, which mark this LM, large uh, language model, it's just same, you know, uh, chat GPT or Bart that has special prompts attached to it, right? So it will perform different roles for us. And I will jump a little bit further to the benchmark. And do we see the GPT-4, vanilla GPT-4 produce 67%. With reflection, you produce 91% accuracy. And you don't need to, you know, uh, sample this model uh, one million times. You can do it almost like human would do, just, you know, in sequence, asking what's happening, what's going on, what needs to be changed, and so forth. If you guys are interested, uh, there is prompts that are being used. One, two, three. But, you know, they are uh, very much vanilla. Yep. And there is uh, one more interesting uh, framework. It's a parcel framework. Um, it's kind of hy hybrid of you know the uh, previous one plus code T approach. And then you actually you know do multiple sampling and you able to uh, select the correct solution. Here the key that um, before you write any code, you split your task in the subtasks, almost like human do, right? But you don't. Usually people don't start typing right away, right? They have some ideas, they break it down hierarchically and then they implement each component. So same thing here. And they showed that this approach can be used you know, for programming, for coding and other interesting applications. Yep, results are good, it's great. Now, question is, where's the future? This is all great. I think future is in multimodality multimodality because previous examples that I showed you, you know, there is a clear description. There is a text input, text output. Maybe, this is maybe good for backend, right? But uh, most of us, when we write, you know, the web page or app, there is also a graphical element. How would you, you know, um, you need test the interface? And this is where multimodality comes in. They showed that um, Bart, for example, you can give it the image, the interface. It could be even, you know, a picture on a napkin and it will produce for you CSS code. 
So the multimodality here, you do image in in text out. That's it. Guys, just one thing. If I'm building such systems, I'm interested in these systems. If you uh, would like to collaborate with me, please contact me. Yeah? That's it. Great. Thank you. Uh, if you have, uh, maybe you can just sign up. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. yeah. Questions? Okay. Come to the microphone. Oh, no. You can't get So, um, have you seen like the uh, performance improvement code paper? Uh, it's just creating a data set uh, about GitHub differences, like uh, people using GitHub commits. commits. Yes. To improve the code. Yes, it's not definitely did. Yeah. So, what, what kind of work are you you doing right now? Uh, I assume you're, you're working on. This is my fun project. It's not you know work related to anything. Uh, I help to teach it them. This is my you know, official role right now. My official role, I I teach at Thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, so when you're talking about the model generating Z tests, um, is there any like I guess score for learning coverage or like or, or we like assess uh, how well the tests uh, this is a very good question. To my knowledge, uh, these particular um, frameworks, they did not use the coverage score, but that's a good idea. There is no coverage score. These models did not use coverage score, but I think it's a good idea. I think you should do it. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, the question was about coverage score. Uh, the FUNI testing, there is also coverage, right? How much uh, of the code uh, unit test did cover? And a uh, person asked me, is the coverage score being accounted somehow? To my knowledge, no, but I think it's a good idea to do it. Mm -hmm. uh, so I was wondering if there is any work regarding the uh, uh, search approaches, especially for the fourth generation, given that I can see that in classical generation, you know, it's a, you don't really have the advantage of syntax speeds and whatnot, but in this, you do have like a verification of private that's kind of scale. But do we have, do you have any discussion? So this is the example of beam search, right? right. So example of beam search, um, the probability outputs, it's out uh, distribution of tokens that you get from large language model, right? So there is no AST at this moment. So uh, to my knowledge, nobody does that right now. I, it won't be easy to do. I, I hear you, I think it's an interesting idea. It won't be easy because right now it sits all on GPU, the inference and stuff. It's not easy to get into that process. Mm -hmm. Any more questions? No, we're good. Okay, great, great. Thank you so much for. Thank you.